All right, hello everybody. Uh, today we're gonna get into topic 4.2, which is gonna be on signal transduction. So what happens after that ligand binds to the receptor, um, but before the response is actually given? So when we talk about uh, cellular pathways uh, or cellular communication after the ligand reaches the receptor, uh, we have three main components. The reception component, which is what we've already talked about here in class, where the ligand binds to the receptor. We have the transduction component. This is where chemical messengers will relay the signal from the receptor, and then we have the response. Uh, today's is mostly going to be on transduction, so we're going to be talking about these chemical messengers and how they kind of relay a message in order to get the response that they need out of their target cell. So reception occurs uh, when the ligand uh, binds to the receptor, as we said before. So here's a, another picture of a receptor cell, so we can see an integral protein here. Now, typically what's going to happen is these receptor cells are going to take an inactive protein called GDP, uh, just like ADP or ATP, the DP stands for diphosphate or triphosphate, but it's going to take this inactive GDP and it's going to activate it to, G to GTP. Okay, so we're just essentially activating this protein here that's connected to the receptor. This GTP protein will then bind to an enzyme, uh, which will then trigger phosphorylation. Now, not every single transduction is going to be like this. This is just kind of an example of how a receptor might uh, get a pathway started. So in this case, a receptor will activate GDP. That GDP will become GTP, which will then trigger an enzyme reaction and so on and so forth down this kind of cascading effect. Now, ligands uh, can also be used to open gate channels uh, that disperse ions across a channel. In fact, this is how your neurons communicate with each other. Uh, so here uh, you can see some synaptic vesicles, so things carrying ions. And what happens is the ligon can bind to these different uh, C, uh, CA, so calcium transmitters, open them up, and allow ions to kind of flow through. So here we have a different type of ligand. Uh, communication, which isn't based on activating proteins in the cell, but instead activates proteins to open up so that this calcium can flow from one neuron to the other. Very similar to those cardio, uh, cardiac cells that we looked at in the first lecture. Now, once reception ends, this is where transduction is going to be. And transduction is pretty much made up of two different components. You have the move component, in which the signal is going to be moved from the membrane to wherever the response is and the amplification part. This is where one reception is gonna be turned into thousands of messages. Now, when we talk about these transduction pathways, uh, we're gonna be talking about upstream and downstream a lot. Essentially what this means is that the beginning, so where the signal first starts by combining to the receptor, this is gonna be upstream. And then down here is going to be downstream. So the signal is essentially being passed all the way to the response. So just like a river in which water flows from the beginning to the end, a signal is flowing from the beginning to the end, from upstream to downstream, okay? Now, typically the signal isn't just gonna be one protein that goes to wherever the response, in, response is and it goes. Typically, just like a relay race, the signal is gonna be passed from protein or molecule to other molecules, and it's gonna continually be passed until the response finally occurs. Now, uh, as the signal is passed, it's typically gonna be done through phosphorylation. And phosphorylation, just like we talked about in unit three, is when a phosphate group uh, is taken off of one molecule and put onto another. Now, kinases are gonna be enzymes that are usually add the phosphate groups. So here, uh, we have a dephosphorylated protein. Usually a dephosphorylated protein means it's low in energy, uh, like that GDP that we talked about up here. And then a kinase enzyme is going to take a phosphate group from ATP and attach it to the previously dephosphorylated protein. Now, once it has the phosphate group, this is going to change the chemical nature of the protein and essentially allow it to continue the relay by communicating with other enzymes or molecules. And then later, phosphatase, which is another enzyme, we can see the ACE here, will take that protein back off, and then it goes back to dephosphorylated so that the signal stops moving. 
So you have an on switch with these kinases and an off switch with these phosphases. Now, molecules will also use other types of relay messages um, to, in order to move uh, the signal, just like we talked about here. We refer to these as secondary messengers. Uh, secondary messengers tend not to be as complex as the enzymes that we see here. A good example of secondary messengers include things like CAMP, uh, AMP being that monophosphate, uh, calcium, just like we talked about with the neurotransmitters up here, or phospholipids are another common one as well. Now, the main purpose of secondary messengers is that they're going to be amplifiers. Um, and it looks like we're going to talk about it here on this one. Uh, they're going to be amplifiers. And what that means is that they're going to take a signal and they're going to multiply it out uh, so that we have multiple signal transduction pathways from the receptor to the cellular response. So you can imagine, let's say, you know, we were, we're doing our diabetes uh, case that we've been talking about a lot, and the insulin binds to the receptor, and then we go down this entire transduction pathway, and then the cellular response is to make a single protein to allow glucose in. Well, that's very inefficient because if we have one insulin creating one protein, I'm going to need thousands of insulin to create thousands of proteins in order to keep up with cellular respiration. So in order to make this whole process more efficient, we're going to use these secondary messengers as a way to kind of speed up or amplify uh, this response. So instead of this reaction only occurring once, with one ligand using these camps, we might be able to amplify the signal to happen hundreds of times. Now, what the response is going to be, there is a large amount of uh, variety here, and we'll talk more about this uh, as we go. But these include things like protein synthesis, activation of genes, release of hormones, steroids, or signals, passing electrical signals, or maybe the development of certain cells. So here you can kind of see that entire pathway that we've been talking about here. So we have a growth factor, which is a ligand. It binds to the receptor. The receptor activates a G protein, which then activates a phosphorylation cascade. So a lot of enzymes passing phosphate groups to each other. Right. This is going to activate another protein, which will then increase the amount of translation and transcription that is going on in our genes. Now, we haven't talked about translation and transcription yet. It just means reading DNA so we can make proteins. So we make a lot of those copies of that, of that gene, and then we turn that into making proteins, and then those proteins can help the cell grow and divide. So here's just kind of a, a large, broad example of how transduction can lead to a response. Okay, So that's where we're going to leave it for today. Trust me, we will talk way more about these relay messengers, um, these transduction pathways, and these responses in class. Just try to pick up what you can for today, and we will talk more about it tomorrow.